Welcome to Chapter 10 of your Business Statistics course. This is uh, the second chapter that you had on co confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. You just would have completed single sample hypothesis testing in Chapter 9. And Chapter 8 would have led you through all of confidence interval building for single sample. This is going to take that to the next step and lead us to something called a NOVA eventually. We're going to start by looking at two populations with two separate samples drawn, one from each population. What we'd like to do in this chapter is look at making some inferences, that is drawing a sample, creating a statistic, and see how that looks versus the population's parameter value, x bar versus mean, in this case, x bar versus mu. And we're going to do it based on this independent sampling, where the two samples drawn there is no common dependence on how they're drawn. They're drawn randomly, random can, to those separate populations. The next will be to create um, an inference based around something called matched pairs. This matched pair sampling is a pretest, post test where we have a focus on one object. Is there a pretest, post test effect, or is it, say, a particular person, such as an appraiser of a house appraising? the house being appraised by two people or one person appraising two separate houses. We're looking at one point of reference and looking at sort of a before and after or difference between something to see if there's an inherent difference happening. Was there an effect? So what are we going to do here? Well, with this, we're going to look at the two samples. And it's important to understand that we're drawing two samples. Well, the reality is we're drawing a lot of samples over and over and over and over again. We saw that in chapter nine. We're going to draw one, but the assumption is that for the statistics to work, we're going to repeatedly sample in the same manner and the same size over and over and over again to see the repeatability to gain this measure of confidence that we know, right? So these samples are drawn independently from one another by their population, and what we're going to do is make sure they're clearly delineated, separated, <clears throat> and we know that we're trying to to go after the mean of each of the populations in this kind. So it's a means test, and we're going to look at it three different ways to start, and then we'll move into the matched pairs. So we're going to start by looking at this difference. We're going to do a comparison mu1 to mu2. Are they the same? Is one greater than the other? Is one less than the other? We do know that when we draw the samples x bar versus mu1 and x bar 2 versus mu2, their difference is the point estimate for the difference between the populations. Very much makes sense as these statistics are trying to tell the story of these parameters. So when we draw those samples, we assume that those samples, that their difference between them, the difference is normally distributed. And that makes a lot of sense because we often make this, this, this decision that normal distribution is clear. But what we're finding is that as we combine them, as they roll up, they're also normally distributed. What helps us significantly is when the sample size for the first mean and the sample size for the second mean are greater than 30. So if n1 is greater than 30 and n2 is greater than 30, the central limit theorem will kick in for us. So the difference, the repeated difference of the mean, is approximately normal anyway. So the assumption is there, but it also holds because now we know we're approximately normal based on the central limit theorem. This goes way, way back to when we start drawing samples and why we draw samples of at least size 30. <clears throat> now, I said there's three different scenarios. The first is the easiest, and in the real world, probably the least used, is we draw two samples and we know what the variances are from the population. You may or may not know this. In this course, you'll be given this. It's hard to know what they are, because if you think about it, if you know what the sigmas are, you know what the mu's are, because mu's are driven, sigma's driven by mu, you're going to know both. Let's assume you know them. You would use a simple z distribution. If you don't know them, or you only know one or the other, you can either assume that they're equal or not. If there is an assumption of equality, you're going to use a t-distribution, knowing that the variances are equal, or at least you think they're equal, or darn near equal. You use a pulled variance, p-o-o-l-e-d variance, and we represent it by s squared sub p. If you don't know if they're at all the same, 
you can't make that assumption. You use the t distribution, but you use separate variances, but you use a very unique degrees of freedom. Hard to calculate, but it is something that is done. <clears throat> Let's start talking about when we have sigmas. This should look really familiar in form. Here is your x, here is your z, here is your standard error, confidence interval. So this is a 100 times 100 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval. I take the difference between the two. Most of the time we assume this to be zero. I add and subtract my z statistic. Remember this is from the norms in variety. And I take each of the variances and add them together. Notice I don't pull them in any way because I have to use their individual sample size to give them a kind of an, a variance on average. Easily done, easily calculated. Those numbers come straight, straight out, straight out of Excel if you're using Excel. But they're very, very simple statistics. If you're using the t distribution, because you don't know sigmas, or you know one or the other, but not both. And in this case, you assume that they're equal. You use the pooled variance. Well, let's just start at the bottom. Degrees of freedom, sample size of the first sample, sample size of the second, and you subtract 2. You subtract 2 because it's n sub 1 minus 1, that's normal degrees of freedom minus 1, plus n sub 2 minus 2, minus 1. So it's n sub 1 minus 1 plus n sub 2 minus 1. That gives us n1, n2 minus 2. Simple enough. That degrees of freedom is being used in the calculation of the variance. It's also being used here in the t statistic. And what I'm going to do is weight each of the variances, sample variances, by their degrees of freedom and ratio by it. Therefore, we're saying that it's a pooled value, pooling them together. And I multiply that and I distribute it through this 1 over n. So it'd be s squared sub p over this and over this. It's pooled, so we're assuming that they're equal. That makes sense, right? We're saying that they're assumed to be equal. Let's let the pooled value be equal for each. This doesn't change. This changes from z to t, degrees of freedom. Easy to calculate. This is a bit tricky with the, the s sub p, but that's OK. Degrees of freedom are straightforward. Very common to treat degrees of freedom this way. Here is the more complex way of looking at a confidence interval. This is the same. This is the same. This looks a lot like we had with z and the sigmas, except that the degrees of freedom right here is being treated this way. You're ratioing, so you're taking the variance, sort of like a, a variance um, pieced individually by sample squared, given its degrees of freedom for each total. This is a very difficult thing to calculate in Excel. I'll give you an op, a, a pre-done values so you don't have to recreate the wheel. But one little slip up in Excel, and you've got a degrees of freedom that's off by a lot. But this is very uncommon to calculate. Many times people re replace this with n1 plus n2 minus 2, and you usually get something very close. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> it might be something to look at if you're comparing two, just to see if this one's off base, if you're told do n1 plus n2 minus 2 and see how close they are. So we saw the confidence intervals being built. Well, guess what? You can do hypothesis testing just as easily. Just like we saw for single sample, you can have a two tail. Notice the equality here. This is a right tail with the equality in the normal. Left tail, lower tail with the equality here. So you have a 1 versus 2, 1 versus 2, 1 versus 2. Two tail, upper, lower, <clears throat> and you'll notice there's something called d sub zero. That's called the difference of zero, or in this case, assumed to be zero. So let's just assume that mu one minus mu two is equal to zero. Is there a significant difference between them? That's where we're going to start thinking about significant differences. And if we assume these all to have a difference of zero, <clears throat> and that happens most of the time, it's easy to calculate. And from that, we'll have both a t and a z. First the z, this should all look familiar from the confidence interval. This is the front end of the confidence interval, and here is your standard error. This is 99% of the time zero. This, the closer this is to zero, makes the numerator zero, gives you a very low t score, makes it not far from the very from the center, as we know. If you're not far from the center of a z of zero, you're not going to be far out in the tail, you're not going to reject. <clears throat> 
you can convert this z to a p-value. Remember, we use norms and a dist side of it, either norms.s.dist <coughs> or however you want to do it. But it's pretty simple to calculate. When we don't know sigmas, but we're assuming they're equal, degrees of freedom should look the same. This should look the same. And again, the pieces are the same. Here's the front of the confidence interval. Here's the standard error that is distributed on a pooled value basis. And this is usually zero. Again, the closer this is to zero as a difference, the closer you are to the center, the, higher, the less likely you are to reject. And the same thing goes for when they're not assumed to be equal, you don't know anything about them, same deal. Here, here, here. The T statistic that's being created when you go and create the T, flip it over from a T, T dist, you have to use this big value of degrees of freedom. Just make sure that you do check to make sure that when you create this, it's not too far different from what you'd have in this degrees of freedom. <clears throat> now, let's look at a couple of examples. <clears throat> we can see them done, and I'll do them in Excel with the hard code. But more often than not, when you encounter these things, you're going to have complete data sets, and you're going to be able to use your description statistics tool I'm sorry, your data, data function analysis tool, and there's several different kinds of Excel functions that let us solve all these different problems. But here's one. <clears throat> you're looking at a group, you're looking at nicotine and cigarettes, a sample of size, sample of size 20 for brand A and 25 for brand B. You get this data. You get the sample, sample means, you get the sample standard deviations, and you get sample size. So this is going to be a T statistic. We don't know if it's a sigma. We know it's not a sigma known. Now we have to decide, is it going to be, do you have some idea that they're equal or not? Well, let's construct a 95% confidence interval, test these means. <clears throat> and what we'll do is, taking this, look at the difference between the means and see whether or not, as we see it here, is this difference we're seeing here between the means, is it going to be zero? So if we do a confidence interval in this case, let's assume that the variances are unknown. We know that, but let's see if they're equal. So what we'll do is create the statistic from this data. Let's look at this in Excel. So here we go. And I pulled in all these points that we just saw on the slides. <clears throat> what I have is the data. Here's T. Here's the confidence interval. Calculate the T based off the degrees of freedom to pool. Here's the data set. So what I'd like to do is first calculate the pooled statistic. Let's do that. Blow this up a bit for you. So what I've done is go through this in the green right here. And I've plunked it in here. It's kind of complicated to calculate because there's a lot of parentheses going on. But I'm taking the degrees of freedom times the variance, <clears throat> which I had to square the standard deviation plus the other side, degrees of freedom times the other variance, and divide by the degrees of freedom. That gives us the pooled variance. From there, we can create the degrees of freedom, which is 20 plus 25 minus 2. <clears throat> That's how we get the 43. And we'll use that to create our T statistic. So what do I have? I have S of P. I have the pooled. I know the two sample sizes. They're given below. Sample size, sample size. I know the two different means, 1.68, 1.95. All that's left is the T statistic. So I'll do that here. We've done this before. I'm going to use t.inv, so it creates a value. It's a two-tailed T. I want a 95% confidence interval, so I plunk in my alpha, which is 1 minus 95%. And I have 43 degrees of freedom, and I get a value of 2.017. I'll use that in my calculation where I take 1.68 minus 1.95, subtract, come on the lower tail, the value I just calculated, times the square root of the pooled value times 1 over 20 plus 1 over 25. I know that gets a little loopy in here. or nesting quite a bit, but this is out there for you to look at. There's the lower. Exactly the same on the upper, except now I'm adding, blow this up a little bit, sorry, blow this up, except now I'm going to add the value here. 
and I get a confidence interval that goes from negative 0.4 to negative, one, negative 0.13. Notice what's not in there. Zero. Zero's not in there. So therefore, we know the difference is going to be less than zero. If zero was in there, we would have to conclude that there's neither an increase nor a decrease that I can prove. So therefore, I wouldn't reject any kind of null that had mu1 minus mu2 equal to zero. So in this case, the confidence interval points to a value where the first a is less than b, and we've just proven statistically significantly that that's the case. We don't know how much, we just can reject the null with this confidence. And that's what we get here. <clears throat> now what if we took the same idea here, same data, but assumed them not to be equal and went through this whole process? So rather than the pooled, I already have this, I'll take the S1 and I'll square it. I'll take the 22 and square it, 0.22. I'll take the 0.24 and square it right here. So I have those two pieces, that, that, I knew my sample size, I knew my difference. Now I just need my t-statistic. The problem is this degrees of freedom. Let's go down and calculate that. This is it. Again, I'm not going to make you do this. But I'll make sure this is out there for you to look through. And I've created the degrees of freedom just to show you what happens. Here I go. I get 42.15. I know that 20 plus 25 is 45, minus 2 is 43. You're supposed to round down, so you're only off by one. One little math mistake, and this number could be 6. So we want to make sure, sure, that this new number that we created for the um, not knowing they're equal, the variances, is close to what it would have been for equal. Just quick back of the envelope check. Once that's done, we can calculate t-statistics very simply, just like we did before, except that in having 43, we now have 42. There we go. So, calculate the same way, we plunk in the values, and you can see the confidence intervals really aren't that different, and both don't contain zero. Just to give you an idea how you would do one and the other, and I'll make sure this is available for you. Back to what we're doing. What about something where we look at, just saw this, sorry, um, if we did a confidence interval or a hypothesis test, as we said, zero is not included. So therefore, you could, could find that you reject the null and find that they are different. As a matter of fact, one was less than two. What about something different looking at some kind of expenditure? Actually, you know what? Let's take a look at a sigma known problem. What if we looked at values for sigma known? And we'll get to this here in a bit. What if we used a confidence interval for sigma known with this data set? Well, I know what x bar is for 1 and 2. I know what sigma, and I'll square it for both. So I'll square 12.5 and 9.25. I know that 35 is n1 and 30 is n2. I just need z. Well, z is pretty easy. What I'm going to do is calculate my z statistic for this. If I want to do a confidence interval or a hypothesis test, a z statistic would take their difference divided by the square root of their standard error. 12.5 squared divided by 35 and 9.25 squared divided by 30 sample size, and that gives me a z statistic. I could use a z statistic here for a hypothesis test, but you could also see that I could create a confidence interval by using a value of, if I had a value needed to be, I could use a norm value for dis. So I could do a norm.s.inv, I'm sorry. And if I knew the probability, say I wanted a 95% confidence interval, I could put 0.05 in for the lower, or I could do norm.s.inv and put 0.95 in for the upper. This would be lower and upper, and I could just put these in the same way I just did for t over here. Substitute in t here, value here of 2.018, that value would then just be 1.64. I just want to point that out. It's just so easy to do these. It almost gets glossed over. We do lower and upper. Back to the, the discussion, what about hypothesis testing for two means?
like this. We're looking at food expenditure for households, city one, city two. The average weekly food expenditures in one is more than that in city two, so one greater than two. Take 35 households in city one, 30 in city two, magic number 30 here, so you do get the central limit theorem kicking in. This is what we just saw when we tried to give an example of how we could start the process for confidence interval building. What about the hypothesis test for this, where city one will calculate a value for x bar one to map against mu one, x bar two for city two against mu two, and I want to see if city one is more than city two. That's my alternative hypothesis. There's no equality there. So what I'll do is call that alternative. Everything else in the number line goes here. The difference would be mu1 minus mu2 is greater than 0. So if mu1 minus mu2 is greater than 0, if that's what we can conclude by rejecting the null, then we have something. Let's go look at this statistic. This is where we got started. There's that statistic. All I have to do is use that statistic, norm dot s dot distance. Let's look at that. If I created a norm norm dot s dot dist of the z statistic, and I'm going to say true because it's an accumulative value, I get a value of 0.968. Now remember, when it's a z, z distribution, it's completely looking back. So I'm looking down upon the lower 968. This is an upper tail test. That's what this is. So I need to look in the upper tail. So I'll take 1 minus what I just did to give me what's in the upper tail. So the p-value probability being the upper tail, where you are, there's a 3.2% chance based around this z-created value. Well, that 1.85, as we saw, just converts to 0.322. Remember, it's 1 minus because we're looking up into the tail because it's an upper tail test. The 0.968, again, that's when you look at a value of 1.85. You look down on the lower 96.7% of all observations. That's less than 5. We reject the null. When we find that, you know, 1 is more than 2. And so they truly do have larger expenditures. You can run something like this in Excel if you're given the data. Let me just give an example. We just did several of these when you had to kind of work your way through using the norm dist and norm inv kind of functions and do some calculations on your own. Excel has several really powerful formulas built in. And they're all driven through the data tab using data analysis. Now, if you haven't installed this, I say do so. It's a great time to do it. Pair difference, which we'll get to. Z-test, we just saw that. Z-test, two sample for mean, that's sigma knowns. Here's your t's. Either you assume they're equal or you don't. Well, here's a data set. Let's take a look at this. Golden oil. And let's just don't even worry about what it means. Let's just see if we can run a, a two-sample test. First, let's try a t t let's try a z test on this. Let's just see what happens. I would like to run the z test to sample for means. What I would do is I'd plunk in my value for range one, range two. I would assume that there's no difference. Let's just say I knew that, that 40 was the variation for each. For the first, they don't have to be the same, but let's just say they were. Add my labels, and I'm just going to put it right here in Excel. Hit the hammer, and it gives me a z-test for p-value for one tail, p-value for two tail, which is nothing more than a double. I could do the same thing, data analysis. Let's just assume that they're unequal. I can come over here. Gold. Oil. Sorry, gold should be in the first. Happens a lot in Excel. Don't worry, it happens to the best of us. Happens to me all the time, so I guess I'm not one of the best of us. Zero is the mean difference, and I have labels. I'm just going to put this over here. Again, you're going to get p value value if you had an idea that they were equal you could even run a third one so i'm just showing you that even though the data set will be very specific of what you have to do it's so easy to run these here i would run this and what this is going to do we know 
when they're assumed equal, it's going to create a pooled value for variance. See that pop up here in a second again. It's had labels. Let's throw this over here. And what you'll notice here, the difference is between the two t tests, here's the pooled variance. Degrees of freedom are off by one, so they're close. Don't worry about degrees of freedom here. But in all cases, one or two tail, we're going to reject with these really large p values. I just want to show you this because this is the common way we'll do things. Z and the t-test when you have lots of data. So easy to run this at use data analysis. It's to your benefit to use Excel as much as possible. Using the tables while it's appropriate. I, I did it in learning statistics and most people did my age. This is a very great way to get to exact values for P. Now the last few bits we're going to cover, and here is that golden oil data set. We're looking at the gold in the in oil industry and we're you know, 5%, are they, are they the same or not? Just did this test, we already know we're not going to reject even at the one or two tail. We want to know, are they the same or not? So a two tail test, we assume normal, normality, we assume variances are unknown and unequal. So that's a great one. We, we ran that one, and I just ran you through this. So I kind of got ahead of the, of the game here. But it's very simple to do, and I'll have additional videos on how to do these kinds of tests throughout. I have plenty of videos on how to do all kinds of things in Excel, but these are particularly important because this is the first step that we will get to multiple mean comparisons. And we saw the output. So we're not going to reject the null, meaning that the, that the null hypothesis of equality is going to hold. There's no significant difference between the two. P-value is so large, it's almost to the point where it's a super no reject. So they're not significantly outperforming. They're not significantly different. The last piece is something called matched pair sampling. This is rather unique and it's hard to spot. But knowing when talking about pretest, post-test is usually the dead giveaway. What we're looking for is the difference. So beginning and end, we take a look at that difference and we measure the difference completely as if it were just a single sample t-test. That's really what this is, because it's an object test, t-test. So when they're normally distributed or greater than 30, usually assume normality, but you're hoping that they're at least 30, so central limit theorem kicks in, we can do the before and after test. And what we want to measure is difference. So does that have an impact? Is, does uh, an intervention have an impact? Does a particular person have an impact, or so on? On an, as an object being affected before and after diet, before and after LSAT testing, um, pretest, post-test on um, GMATs to get into an MBA program, and so on. We also can look at, uh, at the same position, two different pieces of that are seem to be exactly the same in this case, JSON plots of land that are considered to be almost exactly the same. You put non-organic on one, F and organic on the other and you want to see whether or not there's a difference in impact based on assuming all things are held the same. Notice though, <clears throat> when we do this, it has the difference, except we call it D bar. Again, it's just a t-test. We're just going to run it as if you saw a t-test in a confidence interval that you saw in chapter 8, where D bar just becomes a single number, and S sub D is based around that difference. Then we'll run these things out with a simple degree of freedom of n minus 1 because we're just using a t-test. Two tail, upper tail, lower tail, follow the beak. Notice the equalities here. Remember I said D sub zero is the difference assumed to be zero. Very, very similar. Again, as I told you in chapter nine, once you get the concept of hypothesis testing, two, upper, lower, doesn't matter, two, right, left, get one, you've got them all. Statistic, it's going to be a T test. So it's a T. D bar is what you're Calculating from the differences, d sub 0, assumed to be 0. The standard deviation based on d bar. And here's your sample size. Very straightforward. Productivity is a great example here. Do you improve productivity at a plant by changing the layout of a workstation? So you look at the productivity of 10 workers before the change and after the change. And you want to test the impact that that change had. So 
you assume forever and always that there wouldn't be a change, but the hope is that through the change you can reject the null and find out that people are more productive because of the change of layout. Let's just test that at say at 5%. So let's just say you were given D bar and you know that the difference becomes 8.5. Well, you're assuming zero, so that's a lot more than that, but there is some variability here. So the standard deviation is 11. It's a small sample size, so it's a T. It, it's gonna be sketchy. So I come through, I calculate, here's my 8.5. Here's my 11.38, that's my standard deviation sample size. I created a T statistic, it's a two tail, nine degrees of freedom and you get 2.62 and you get it, this is your confidence interval. 0.36 to 16.6. Look, it got a lot closer to zero than I would have hoped or expected. But in any case, zero is not in there. Just proven, the two tail test, in making this improvement of productivity happens, the layout workstation change. Your change caused, in a way, can't prove it fully what that, what that would be, but we know that by changing the workout, we have now changed the dynamic and people are now more productive than they were. I don't know how much more, we just know it's more than what they were. And we get this. It's an interesting thing to calculate. And in Excel, it's, it's a lot of work to do the dynamic. And what I'm just showing here is if we look at, say, 40 Starbucks cup holders, card holders before and after, about um, caloric information intake and amount of calories you drink before, after, you take all the differences from before to after, create your D, you would just simply run a T test on this. And we'll look at one here in a second. So Excel is a great tool for this. We can run differences quite easily. So let me just show you one. And this, I'll put, post this out here for you to look at, but when we look at the pair differences, they're as easy to run as the t-test and z-test for two sample. Let's look at some. Here's that, that Starbucks case. Here were all the differences. So the before and after caloric, there is this, this pair difference under data analysis t-test paired to sample before and after. Assume the difference to be zero. I had labels and put it right below the one above it. Hit enter. And we get a resulting t-tail, t-test to sample this case it's going to be paired difference the two tail p value is 11% and the one tail is 5% both are greater than 5% so we could reject the not reject the null in the case before and after very similar to all we've seen what i wanted to get to was this remember this thing something like this that you've seen it's a template for a simple hypothesis test when you don't know sigma, a t-test. Well, here's this data, and I took the difference between all of them. This new value called difference. If I find out that there were 40 observations, and I took the mean of that group, I took the sample standard deviation of that group, I assume the value to be zero, you know what you get? You get a value here, p-value, upper tail, and if I look at it, let's take a look at this. That value is exactly the same as that value. So I can run it as a paired two sample from means t-test, or I could run it as a normal t-test as I've done all along. Either one is fine, but I just want to show you that the paired difference becomes nothing more than a simple t-test when you take that difference. The only problem is, have to make sure that you have paired difference data set, a pretest, post test, or something that's identified as paired difference. Again, it's hard to spot, but hopefully the giveaway is in the problem or the layout of the problem that either you see or you create. That's it for chapter 10. Next stop is taking a look at variances and how do we do hypothesis testing, how do we do confidence intervals for variance,
if you've got it down from 8, 9, and 10, as we roll on into 11, not too difficult. See you soon.